people in the room and we were making it up as we went along. There was no playbook. There were very few resources. And so I just became that person. And I realized early on one of the benchmarks that I had for client success um, that I didn't know every, I couldn't quite unpack what it was around that was getting to the point where a client would give me a smiley face. I knew somehow I had broken through and I had made a dent in the trust factor when I got some sort of humanity in otherwise very professional serious emails. Um, so I was always on the lookout of how can we build that rapport without going overboard. This is still a work setting. Um, but we get to the point that there really is this demonstrated communication signal that we're in it together. This has transitioned since I made the move out west um, and ultimately became self-employed for a few years, living out in the woods, of which I still am. Um, we'll get to that in a little bit. Um, of course, emojis came along and we got a bit more sophisticated in our, in our visual indicators of happiness, success, and camaraderie within projects. Now we have today, um, and of course, I've leveled up the bar again. By the time we get to launch, I want us to be sharing gifts. I want us to be celebrating together and really know that throughout the project, even if you know things never go perfectly, we've been able to keep the communication and the trust together to the extent that it feels like we really truly are celebrating in partnership. You have probably heard people equate websites to houses. Um, the construction analogy comes up a lot. It almost invariably comes up and then is after that, the, the traumatic story of a contractor that left someone high and dry, the electrician who messed something up, the, the devastating movers that broke everything, it comes with this trauma of a bad experience in that context. I've rarely heard someone use the construction analogy for good. Um, and But it is really applicable, and especially when you're in a territory such as digital and website design and, and development that may be very unfamiliar. It could have no bearing on your day-to-day -day other than updates that you need to make to content on your current website, it does become a scary zone, much like if you were going out and you were building a website, you were building a house from scratch. And so when we look at these different foundations, these different pieces, such as buying a plot of land, figuring out the, the mailing address um, that you're going to have, the number on the street, uh, the blueprints to decide what that house is going to actually look like, this is an overwhelming amount of work. And some of you maybe have only had instances of moving that's okay too. Even that alone, if we're not taking into account renovations and upgrades to a house um, or starting from scratch, that in and of itself could be quite a stressful undertaking. Now, before I go into the story that's going to anchor a lot of, you know, again, how I came to find words to demonstrate and think about the ways that I want to develop relationships and the ways that I want to help clients understand how to navigate website redesigns and developments as low stress as possible. Can't commit to no stress because it is stressful, but low stress as possible. This story I'm about to tell you does have a certain degree of privilege. Um, and in light of everyone in this world having a certain degree of anxiety and stress, given a pandemic that seemingly is never going to end, but it will, we are in a place where, you know, there are a number of people out there that are struggling to find housing. They're struggling to, to maintain that. We have been and were in a very fortunate position to have a little bit of money that meant that we could take a really big leap. Not enough money to buy a big house, but to make a big leap. We also live in an environment where we don't have building codes, minimum square footage, things that would have potentially made our dreams not the reality that we could. Big caveat. So... From 2015 to 2018, my partner and I lived in a tent. We lived in a canvas wall tent on the land that we had bought um, raw. We, we worked together to figure out where we were gonna cut down the trees. I got to choose the number on my street um, that we that we have. Um, we did everything from the land um, and made a concerted effort to conserve our costs and to get to know the land on site um, versus living somewhere else while it was being developed um, separate from us. So we were deeply entrenched in a construction zone at all times for multiple years. Um, this was a wonderful experience. It was also a very scary, stressful experience. And it helped me be better equipped to put myself in a client's shoes for just how stressful and scary that leap of faith is when you sign a contract and you all of a sudden have tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars that you're putting in the hands of someone else and trusting that they're going to steward appropriately 
and get you what you need in the end in order to continue to drive your mission and vision for your organization. And so this changed my perspective because I was actually able to experience for the first time just how difficult and, and unnerving that can be when you don't have all the aspects around the work at hand, helping you understand what you need to understand about the way the process works, the stage that you're in, and, and what your accountability is throughout the process. I was living the Wix life. So while you, you know, may have big aspirations for a website that's catering to all your needs and has all the functionality embedded in this integrated experience, you also may at this current moment have a single landing page, maybe it's a coming soon page, or you've used a Squarespace, a Wix, a Weebly to get something up and running, but you also know that there's a bit of a time frame around how sustainable that is for your organization to truly scale and grow. Just as I, with two small young babies, had a very concerted period of time where the clock was ticking, we needed more space. There was only so long that we could live this romantic life um, in a tent. Coming back to what my philosophy is, um, Maya Angelou, I think, said it best. Um, people will forget what you said. People forget will forget what you did, but people will never forget how you made them feel. And I think that's intrinsic to when you consider um, whether it's a contractor for a home renovation or a contractor that you've worked with within your organization or someone else that you've in some ways partnered with and, and transferred a degree of power into how you're working together, the feeling that you got out of that positive or negative will dictate whether or not you work with them again, whether you recommend them and whether or not you trust the next person that you might work with in the same capacity. And so I, I take a lot of time to think about the feeling of how we should be communicating and how we can tailor our process for the, the proactive intention of trying to preempt someone's stress levels from going too high. But websites are inherently stressful. There's no way around it. It's a big project and it can seem so straightforward in the surface because when it works well, it looks seamless. It's a great experience. When it doesn't work well, it's obvious, it's frustrating, um, and it, it's something that you, you can't ignore. If you're here, it's likely that you need a website or you just simply don't like your current website and you're wondering what the next step might be. This could be a degree of the website is broken that there's critical functionality that's actually prohibiting your growth and confusing your users and, and maybe eliminating certain audiences from having access to something critical. It could just also be as simple as it's no longer, it's pants that don't fit anymore. It's the wrong message, it's the wrong color, it's just not who you are anymore. And so you've outgrown it and you need something new. It's also possible that you've spent hours trying to figure out how to do it yourself, um, that you've read up because the amount of content out there to tell you how to do it yourself is much greater than it was when I was you know, back there with my very primitive uh, smiley faces. Um, you have all of these resources at your disposal, but do you have time? And do you really have the appetite and the interest to become an expert in web design and development? So you are likely very invested or your organization has delegated to you to be invested in this whole undertaking of a website redesign. And that can be very scary when it's not what you've done um, for your entire career. So that fear of the unknown of what to expect, what to anticipate, when the crunch times are gonna be, when you're going to have to get really involved and what you should be doing in the background, all of that education component is really critical. Um, it's vital for you to be able to survive this project without having it be just another horror story of another website redesign that ended with no one's talking to each other and, and it's, it's something that you never want to do again. Um, it should ideally be something that breaks new ground in a way that then can continue to progress and grow with your organization over time. But that is something that you know, I hold very much our agency and, and any agency you might be working with quite accountable to what we can do to reduce or eliminate that. And it's important to note that when I'm speaking in an agency capacity, it's really specific. For us, when we were building, we hired a contractor and it would be unreasonable for me to expect that contractor to also be my project manager, to also be the person giving me all of the updates in a consistent basis to help me budget for things. He tried his best, but that's, that's also the downside that you can have when you're engaging a freelancer. Um, I've been a freelancer myself and it's a, it's a glorious um, undertaking. At the same time, you, if you are not supported by a team, are then beholden to the same communication mechanisms and the same proactive care and support for that client um, who's already working on a million other things and needs this coaching throughout the process 
Otherwise, you're going to have um, undue stress. So by the time you're calling us, it's likely that things are broken. Um, at the very least, it's not something that you want anymore. And I would expect that the urgency factor is high, which is oftentimes why we have people come to us and say, hey, we need a website. 30 days, 60 days, is that about how long it's going to take? And we have to do the work to try to help um, ensure that there's there's a, a shared understanding of how much time is actually involved in doing it right. Not just getting it done, but actually doing it right. When you combine all of this with resistance to change, because change is just hard, um, and internal buy-in, feedback cycles that are happening behind the scenes that we as an agency may not be privy to, but are mindful of in trying to, again, be conscious of timeline, whether or not you have that technical know-how or someone else in your organization does. And of course, that tension between the user experience and the user interface design. We oftentimes have very strong feelings about the design, whereas the design is, is super important, but getting that UX aspect right and honoring the user experience and the, the way that we're guiding someone through a process of a website is just as important, but it may not be as top of mind for you if that's not your area of expertise. So when I think about the levels of stress that our clients are under, um, and having had a number of these conversations with client, where those stress points are at particular points in the process, there's a certain degree of anguish before you've come to the realization and you've, you have the internal buy-in of even hiring an agency or a contractor to be able to rebuild your website. That's where the stress point is going to be high because you are likely out on a limb either by yourself or with a team, just desperate for some sort of bright light that you know there's going to be a change in the future. There's the stress of going into the preparation of actually, you know, preparing an RFP, going out and soliciting vendors, getting proposals from different organizations. That takes time, that takes work, but sometimes the stress goes down because at least you know you're doing something about it. You're empowered to do something. Then you've got your selection. That's a little bit stressful because you have to trust someone. And so we've got the, what do you have to do in a website redesign? What are you trusting us as an agency to do? And what are you also having to do in the background, which is, is not going to go away. You still have your day job that you need to maintain. So anguish preparation, then you've selected us and now the work really begins. And it's important to note that throughout all of it, there are some pretty critical stress points. Some of which when we do our jobs right, we can preempt some of that stress for you and help you understand your role in making that successful and also give you enough information to know what's happening behind the scenes so that you have the clarity and the understanding of what's going on just to know, not necessarily have to do anything about it, but just to know what's happening so that you're not feeling like you're left in the dark or unaware of what's going on. This typically is the kickoff, the UX phase, which is you know, an important aspect of, of what it is that you need to understand that you're even signing off on. Same way I, as build, in building a house, need to know the structure of what it is that I'm building. And then finally coming to testing, which just the clarity around what it is that you're testing in the first place, place is really important. On your side, where you're going to have the most work that needs to happen um, in preparation for a website redesign, that time up front, really gaining an understanding and consensus from your organization of what you know you need and what you don't know that you need so that you can hopefully engage your agency to help you figure out what you really need. That time up front can be really exhaustive and involved. And it's important to take the time and honor that phase of the project to make sure you've done that due diligence. It will help expedite everything else that, that you're doing. Doesn't mean that you have to have all the answers, but at least having some clarity and alignment versus six different people coming with from six different perspectives will help to, to lay the foundation for greater success. And then we have content. We're going to talk about content a lot towards the, the latter half of this, um, of this webinar. Content is a huge undertaking. It cannot start early enough. And it is usually the biggest stress point because it feels like the easiest thing to put off. There's always a reason throughout each of these phases to wait on content. You'll get to it. So I do want to point out that we are in no way saving lives. We are architects, we are strategists, we're in support of you, but we do have a responsibility to really think about our bedside manner. And so when I'm growing team members and when I'm coaching them on how to go about their work, I really stress um, with the team, putting themselves in the client's shoes and thinking about what we know about their needs, but also what we know about their day-to-day. -day. Um, since there's competing factors always for your attention, there's other people that you need to inform 
of what's going on in the process. And so we need to be mindful, not just of how we're communicating with you, but how we're empowering you to be an advocate for the process within your brighter, within the broader uh, organization. Knowledge is power. And it is our responsibility as the agency who have a lot of power in the work that we're doing in the information that we have in the technical know how that we hold to redistribute that and make sure that you feel like you are in the know to the extent that you don't feel like you are powerless in this situation and being dictated to every step of the way that you are absolutely a constituent and a member of the team in a way that feels equitable, responsible and transparent. And so when we talk about the, the aspects of power, the ways that an, uh, an agency can make sure that they're giving that information back to you to build trust, um, we need to make sure that, of course, authority, ultimately, you're the decision makers. And, you know, when my team get, gets blocked on certain decisions and, and how do we go about this, oftentimes it is us empowering you with the information of alternative scenarios so that you can be empowered to do that. We don't need to hide options, but we do need to take the time to explain what the pros and cons of different paths might be. Absolutely give a recommendation where it's asked for, but it's important for you to have the information in order to be able to know why you chose a direction, not just have us tell you this is the way you need to do it because we say that it's the way. Process, clarity there, we emphasize process a lot um, so that you have clarity and comfort in that this is this is how we run projects. It isn't us just cowboying it and figuring it out as we go along, that there is a dedicated process and a, and a method to this madness that can feel like absolute chaos at times when it comes to, to website builds. The memories, um, so our awareness of other projects, what we're bringing to the table, just the production value of what we're putting into the project, the direction in the future. We are always really excited where we get to be partners in that, in dictating what the future roadmap might be, where the growth opportunities, really getting to listen to the challenges and the, the opportunities that you're seeing from an organizational perspective, and then helping you see ways that that could turn into features and into, turn into new functionality um, for the direction. But the biggest piece is trust. And it is uh, the most important aspect of how we can make sure that we are appropriately exchanging power. And there's always clues in the way that people are bringing themselves to the project um, on both sides of whether or not we have instilled trust in each other, that we really are in this together. We've, we're maintaining the, the imperatives of the project and we're stewarding this, pro this um, project in partnership. And so when it comes to creating equitable partnerships with our um, clients, we really work hard to break down those power dynamics to treat our clients as members of the team without creating a whole bunch of work and noise and communication, but that you are involved in the project to the extent that you have capacity for um, and the information that you need to be able to feel empowered and not helpless when it comes to communicating back to your broader organization. We talk about participation, again, as partners, and then the recipro reciprocity, <laughs> reciprocity factor. All of this boils down to communication. Um, and so when it comes to some pieces of the puzzle that I'm going to dig into more specifically, communication is a huge part of what we emphasize throughout the process. In the upfront, um, I've mentioned process. You can see our process here, which starts with discovery. Um, we walk through this in our proposals, and then we walk through it again as part of our kickoff to make sure clients really have an understanding of not just where we are today, but what's the next step in the puzzle? Where are we going next? What can you anticipate? And how can you then be planning for that in and amongst everything else that you're doing um, during your day to day? We'll give an overview of a high level timeline. We then have a much more sophisticated detailed timeline down to the date that's broken out in Asana. But again, just from a planning and capacity um, building perspective for you so that you know when there could be multiple things happening in tandem. So that again, from a planning perspective, you're prepared for it and not hitting unexpected weeks where we're asking for feedback on three different things that you know that in advance and can also tell us that's not gonna be feasible. I have a whole conference that I'm planning. We're going to need to shift the timeline so that again, no surprises. 
our onboarding process is super thorough. Um, and anyone that you're engaging um, for a website redesign, it's really important and helpful to have this kind of comprehensive documentation that not just asks you a bunch of questions, but gives you a bunch of information about how to properly set up your team for success, how to give us the intel and the insight that we need to move forward effectively. Um, and so this is a massive document that part of that preparation phase we ask clients to go through. We wanna hear it firsthand. Um, and we don't want to rely on just the RFP. We want to ask those questions directly and then have one central single source of truth in conjunction with also giving you a bunch of guidance for what you need to do on your side. Our kickoff presentations have um, clarity and slides that go into what to expect. Um, so we talk about workshops, how those function, what presentations look like for when we're doing creative reviews, for example, how we work through feedback together and what those iteration cycles are intended to be and what they should look like, what the testing process looks like, and then content creation, which is sometimes something that we help more with, sometimes something that is completely at the client's discretion. And it depends on, on what that looks like, um, how we would approach that within this early conversation. We also talk about risks because again, trust and transparency comes from open communication and we have to be really clear from the upfront what our expectations are. So we talk about mystery voices, um, which are people in the background who have not been privy to conversations, maybe don't have all of the context, who could come in and completely derail everything. We want to hear from people, but we have to work together and lean on the experience we have of um, working with complex board structures and intricate organizations that are very passionate and invested in the work to make sure that we have clarity about when and how to bring people in so that people feel like they've given their input, but it doesn't completely bring things to a stop because now there's new information that maybe should have been surfaced earlier. Where there might be points of potential delays, the number of revisions and what sort of quantity of feedback we would expect given um, various revision cycles, the availability, especially when we're working with organizations across multiple time zones, and then of course schedule changes. Last year, as you can imagine, schedule changes came up. And so as with anything, adapting was really important and making sure that we were mindful of everybody was in a state of flux. Um, and that continues to a certain degree today. Um, but making it clear that that does have some degree of implications is important so that then there's clarity and we can work together on making the best decision, not surprise people with, well, that has an impact on, you know, we can't launch your website by that date now. Everything has to be couched in clarity from the get-go. And then of course, if there's any dependencies, such as maybe an external brand agency is doing all the branding work ahead of us getting started, all of that should be covered off as well, again, to just make sure that there's clarity from the get-go. Throughout the process of a website uh, redesign or a piece of custom development, such as this case, we do weekly updates. Um, we let a client know, how's the project doing? And so we have this color-coded system of saying, yeah, we're green everything's good. If we have clients that disappear because they've been heads down on a number of other things and we've been stopped and it's derailed the timeline and we haven't had a chance to regroup, that color might change to yellow or even red. Um, it very rarely goes to red. Typically yellow is where it stops. But this gives us and it gives clients that added reassurance that they know what's going on. It, it provides us with the ability to say, here's what you need to know, what you should be checking in on one stop, you've got one email that gives you the documentation that you're going to need for the week. Um, and it tells them what to prepare for this week, what to anticipate. Um, and then if there are anything, any items that were are outstanding, we can just make that sure that's known as well. The accountability goes both ways and having this regular rhythm helps to make sure that, again, everybody knows where things are at and what their role is in continuing to move it forward. Once we get to the end of the project, there's all the issues are closed, um, except for in this case, 16 issues that are all backlogged features that will be post-launch. We have a pre-launch checklist where we go through and, and make sure again that all of the different pieces of the process for launch are taken care of. Um, and so not everything will be explicit. This ticket, for example, is all behind the scenes. Um, and so there's a number of pieces of information that we're taking care of behind the scenes and then really just making sure that clients have the information they, that they need, but never compromising the level of transparency for comfort. All right, so now let's talk about what we need for you. And I'll give some, some examples that relate back to uh, where I started with, um, with my, my Wix tent. So how can you set yourself up for success? Um, hire for the job. So don't just think about, I need a new website. Think about where you wanna go from there. And if it really is truly, you need a 
static website with information, people need to know how to contact you, that's great. You maybe don't need a global agency. You maybe don't need some, some massive organization that's going to cost quite a bit more than a smaller, more boutique enterprise that can get you more for less simply because they're smaller. You need to find the right partner and you need to not do what I did where the foundation of my house was originally supposed to be a barn. And then after they poured the foundation, we said, actually, could we build a house here instead? Don't do that to an agency. So make sure that you're hiring the right person for the job. Um, make sure that you're being conscious of what you're asking them to do and what you really need right now, because the agency that you're working with is likely also resourced on other projects. And so their ability to be able to fit in ad hoc requests sometimes might not be feasible. We try as best we can. We usually are able to staff up, um, but really thinking through what you need today and in the short and long term is helpful because you're investing a lot of time in building a partnership. Think about how that might shift. Again, last year was an anomaly, um, but shifts in that in scope to an extreme degree can undermine success. Um, it can also do, um, it can undermine trust sometimes too. So just making sure that you're being conscious of what you're bringing to the table, that preparation up front from a clarity perspective goes a long way towards everybody really feeling from the get-go like we're in it together. Be flexible. Make sure that you're asking questions and staying close to the project. Um, it's really important, even though you will have a number of competing priorities. Um, and then just make sure that you're being conscious of what you're expecting from an individual member of the team versus the team as a whole. And so in most instances, your project manager or account manager will be your primary point of contact. That'll be the person who is giving you the information. You may not necessarily have the same insight from a developer or a designer who is really solely focused on giving you the best possible end product. They might not be able to tell you the implications of a new feature being added last minute, what that will do to the timeline. Make sure that you're asking the right questions to the right person at any given time. Um, and typically, you know, if you have a strong project manager and account manager, they'll help guide that for you. But, you know, it's something to be mindful of from a success standpoint. Feature specifications, know when you want what you want and know when you don't. And it's really okay when you don't. You don't have to come to an agency having all the examples in the world and knowing exactly what you want to tell them what you need. But if you have an idea and you want to work with an agency and you are able to secure budget to have the agency help to bring that idea to life, that's sometimes an optimal scenario. And depending on the agency you reach out to, there's more or less willingness to kind of live in that gray space. Um, it's something we really welcome and, and really enjoy when an organization is able to come to us saying, we think there's something here. Can you help us to figure out what that might be? That, again, just increases the level of um, investment in the idea itself versus it just coming to us with fully baked specifications that, that now we're there just to execute. We can do that too, and I think we do it pretty well. Um, but the ability to kind of really go into discovery with open hearts and open minds of what's possible versus exactly what we think we need is really important. Um, Encourage your agency to challenge your assumptions. It's a scary space, and so it's easy to lean back on what we know or what we've seen or what we think we know, um, but encourage them to speak up, to, to voice their opinions. And if you're not sure why they make, made a decision, ask. If they don't have a good answer, maybe question that decision. But usually, if prompted, the, the organizations that you work with and the individuals that are working on the work, there's reasons why they've chosen to go in a direction or to not go in a direction. And it's important to note that so for this example here, this is our initial very primitive floor plan. This was after many, many, many scratch pads of trying to figure out how we were going to configure this foundation that we had set up for an entirely different structure. Um, so the number of iterations that were thrown out the window before we got to something that looks semi like this, not exactly, um, was considerable. Your designers, your developers, the people that you're working with on the project have probably gone through that too. So be welcoming of that conversation and, and try to invite it um, versus anticipating that the only solution that you're seeing is the only idea that was explored. Practice giving feedback. 
So feedback is super, super important um, for, for your agency, um, for who it is that you're working with on a website redesign or um, development project. Um, it's really important to have one person on the team be the delegate for that communication. So we use Envision quite a bit or Figma. People can add comments um, and, and jump in there with, with their perspectives. Sometimes, you know, with a small team that doesn't introduce um, confusion, but oftentimes it's much more cohesive if one person is collecting all that feedback, distilling it down into um, something coherent, and then delivering that together. That goes a long way towards eliminating confusion and time just burnt, go going through all the feedback, reconciling it. Some of it's conflicting, some of it's a little bit different, and some of it is just duplicative, um, oftentimes when we have multiple people jumping in to one, uh, one design file. So really thinking about how you give feedback and how you can do the work behind the scenes to deliver something that's coherent and actionable goes a long way towards making sure that you are moving forward efficiently and then also you know spending the time with the agency as productively as possible be conscious also that you should never put pressure on yourself to have words in the moment sometimes when you are reviewing a presentation for the first time especially when this is not something you do all the time it's hard to find the words and and so feel comfortable saying okay that's a lot to digest i'm gonna have to sit with it for a bit that's perfectly okay. And any good agency is going to accept that and welcome that and appreciate that you you just said that because it just says that you wanna take some time to process, to sit with it, reflect on it, and then you're going to come back. So don't feel too pressured to react in the moment. By all means, if you have reactions, share them, but don't feel pressured to if that's just not how, how your brain works and how you process information. Everybody goes through this process a little differently. And then also just be conscious of your minimum viable product. So in this instance, our minimum viable product was we had heat, we had running water, we could take a shower, we had a house. We did not have siding for another two years. And again, luxury of an environment out here without code so we could do crazy things like that. Um, but again, this was for us the where we were able to get to in order to then be able to move in, not feeling like and not being legally beholden to everything being perfectly done, inspected and signed off on before we could move in. So knowing what it is that you need to have, especially if you're constrained by a really important deadline, if you have other factors that are driving getting something out the door now, really being mindful of what has to be there day one and what could possibly wait um, is a really important way to, again, reduce your stress level and have a really productive dialogue with your agency partner. Um, we often talk about it as a phased approach. And so you've got your first phase and then that might be successive phases of feature releases over time. Um, sometimes it's a full on agile, if anyone's familiar with agile project management philosophies, roadmap of continual improvement over what's called a sprint, which is usually a two to four week period of time. And so if that's the size of a project, that might involve us literally having a huge list of feature requirements and then every two to four weeks releasing new features for the website um, in order to continually improve the end product. But every project is like a home, it's iterative. Things are gonna break, things are going to need to be fixed, things aren't gonna look good anymore, you're gonna to wanna to repaint the walls, that's okay. So don't go into a website redesign if you can avoid it, spending everything on that initial build because there are going to be things you're going to learn after the launch that you're going to want to optimize. And so if you put all of your eggs in one basket and spend everything and all your time and all your energy on that build to the point that you're exhausted of even wanting to think about websites afterwards, it's going to be harder to take advantage of all this amazing insight you'll be able to glean once the project has, has gone live. Um, so the most important thing there is just noting that some things can definitely wait. Okay, so now we're gonna dive a little bit deeper into content creation and the migration efforts that go into uh, website redesigns. Um, content creation is huge. And we typically take a modular approach um, to how we do a website designs. So this is one example of a workshop back when we were able to go and be on site with clients where we would actually print out each of the modules and you can see what modules look like right here. And then we would help clients go through and construct pages out of those modules based on the layout, the narrative, the way that pages needed to be structured with each individual section contributing to the greater narrative across the, the hierarchy of the page. 
So when you're taking a modular design approach, um, it is really important to be thinking about each of these sections as important building blocks of what it is you're trying to accomplish, what you're asking the user to do. But this all starts with just getting words down on a page. So much like if you have ever had the wild idea of wanting to write a book, um, you have to start writing. That's the most important thing. And so really figuring out early on, what is the state of your current content? How accurate is it? How much is it going to need to change and who's going to accomplish all of that, whether it's a team of people or one individual who's going to be responsible for it all, is critical to success. And we've known a number of clients that, um, you know, they do their best to try to do this without appropriate resources. And it ends up being a massive stress point later on in the project because it's an underestimated effort um, going into it. So we typically estimate based on an individual page, two hours per page for content writing and editing, and then about a half hour per page for uploading and configuring and getting all of the um, all of the different creative pieces in place. Um, so for a page, for a website that has 101 pages, that could be 250 hours worth of effort cumulatively. So whether that's something that we then as an agency take on more of, or you have a freelancer or you have a team of people on in your organization ready to go. That's something that you have to be the most mindful of out of all the aspects of this undertaking um, to make sure that you know going into it. Otherwise, it could lead to a lot of late nights and, and scrambling and unnecessary stress later on in the project. So start considering content now. It can never happen early enough. It will definitely be more challenging if you don't have brand guidelines going into it um, to really help steer what that overall miss mission um, and message is um, that will link everything together as you're also trying to digest and, and start to get used to um, all of the new designs that are coming from your agency. All right, so I wanna open up the floor for questions because I've given you a really big picture and I've honed in on some of the biggest aspects that we do to try to make sure that this is as supportive of a process as possible. Um, and then I've talked specifically about content a bit. So we've got about 15 minutes and I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. So Jen, I'll, I'll let you take it from there. Awesome, thanks so much, Rachel. Yeah. It's really informative and it's great like structure really to think about how we build our website. So thank you. Thank you. The very first question is from Tammy who asks if you also work with small businesses as well. That's a great question. We do. We have a few um, emerging uh, startups and we have a few small businesses that we work with. Um, it typically does have some sort of social impact slant. Um, and so there are likely small businesses we wouldn't work with, um, not because they're doing bad in the world, but it just wouldn't necessarily be our sweet spot. But yes, we do. That's awesome. Thank you. <laughs> and Zahra asks, uh, what is, she has two questions. What is the current best practice when it comes to creating optimal user experience? So for services versus products, especially in the space of mobile, complementary so social media, et cetera. For example, so, oh yeah, I can see. No, go it. ahead, yeah. For example, are landing pages, contact pages antiquated, multi versus single page sites, et cetera? That's a great question. It will vary greatly depending on, um, what, where, what stage you are as an organization. Um, so we typically will look at the, the nature of where you're at and try as best we can to scaffold for the future. Um, but there's nothing to say that a landing page that's comprehensive and gives the information and gets people in touch with you would be insufficient. You're minimizing um, the ability to have more um, search engine optimization by having less content, but that's also if you are just creating content for search engines, it's probably not going to work anymore. And, and so the best practice is typically to kind of balance what your resources and capabilities and budget is internally relative to what your users are asking for and really need and what you're asking them to do. And somewhere in the middle should be a, a right-sized website um, or web presence and social media ecosystem around that to drive back to the web presence that gets them in touch and helps to grow your organization. Awesome, awesome. The second part of the question is, does it matter to, um, to users if your site is HTTP versus HTTPS? HTTPS every time. Awesome. Uh, yeah, it's a unilateral, it's everybody looks for it and there's, there's, it's basically free at this point. So from a cost perspective, there's no reason not to and people want that padlock. Nice. Mm -hmm. Alyssa asks, 
Can you give us a sense of the total cost of a redesign with your agency? Oh, it's such a good question. It varies greatly. Um, we have worked really hard um, over the last couple of years to look at our process and look at our tooling and try to make sure that we're able to scale up or down. Um, we have websites that are $200,000 builds um, and they then come with like fifty dollars to $100,000 annual budgets for feature development and optimization. We also have organizations that are $25,000 builds and really they're, the imperative there is for us to help empower them to be able to take on the bulk of the work post-launch. Um, and so it, it really comes down to us um, meeting with a client and assessing their needs and then figuring out whether or not we can do something um, for them for the budget that they have, um, or if that's something that is not the right fit for us. Nice. Thank you. Um, Brian asks, in the current world of world WordPress and self-designing templates, how does one deal with clients that they think that think they know everything? <laughs> Oh, I've never met one of those. Just kidding. Um, I think that it it comes. It's it's a really good question. I I would say that we've seen a lot of growth and um, evolution from templates and some of the the self serve options, so that we are having more sophisticated and informed conversations and less of the reactive. Well, why can't I just go buy a template off of Theme Forest? Um, there's enough people and enough. Um, back to the contractor horror stories, enough instances of people being burned that it's usually fairly easy for us to elaborate on the pros and cons. But I think like anything, it, it really does start with some of those initial conversations to gauge whether or not we have a, a captive conversation uh, that has that reciprocity in it um, versus it's just gonna be a, a wall that we're gonna hit every time. We, we run into that sometimes even with Drupal versus WordPress. Um, you know, what, what it is that people are thinking about philosophically versus what they need technically. Totally. Um, and Andrea asks, can you please address the integration of e-newsletters, best practices for signups, et cetera, for nonprofits? Yeah. So thinking about um, who you're targeting, you have to be really conscious of your privacy policy um, and GDPR and how you are collecting that information. There are a number of tools out there. We oftentimes, if asked, are recommending MailChimp still. Um, it seems to continue to just be the, be the solution that works the best for us. Um, so in terms of best practices, having that be persistent on your website. So it's not just on one single page that you have to drive people to either in the footer um, or somewhere else um, within the design is typically the best way to go, um, making it as easy as possible. But if you are able to building in a process where you can customize the messages and get a better sense for what it is they want to hear from you versus just sending them everything can have a big impact on um, whether or not they're even opening your messages at the end. So we typically will go through an upfront cycle of if it's an early stage, just make sure that people can sign up. But then as things get more sophisticated, also being able to um, tailor that uh, for an individual organization. Nice. We have a question about how do you find, uh, if, for example, it's not the right fit to work with BrightWeb, how would you mm -hmm. suggest finding an, an agency that's the right fit? That's a good question. Um, I think ask around. Like the the biggest, um, most of our work comes through referrals um, when it's not coming through existing business. Um, and so people are coming to us because they've heard good things. Um, so I would, if you are looking at a website um, that you really like, um, reach out to them and, and ask them who they, who designed their website. And you may run up against, you know, it's a website that was built by an agency that's going to exceed your budget, but at the same time, you may not. And, and so I would definitely say just have more conversations with people who are in a similar boat, which is, again, back to the construction analogy, oftentimes how we find out contractors, find out about contractors that we trust too. Awesome. Awesome. The next question is from Corey. What are some of the tools or software that you recommend using to keep a project on track and collaborate with clients? Awesome. So we use Asana for um, our project management, and then we use GitLab for all of our um, feature requirements and our, our quality control um, user acceptance testing once we've gotten to the end phase of the project and clients are going in to review things, ask questions, and, and potentially um, either 
notice something that needs to be tweaked based on the content that they're inputting or see a potential for a future um, feature that, that they may want to have built. Um, so those are the two tools that we use. Um, Asana is our source of truth for the project. And then GitLab is our source of truth for what's happening within the inner workings of the, the build itself. Um, I would say no matter what, uh, having something is really important. It doesn't have to be Asana, but definitely having something in the mix is, is pretty critical. Relying on just email is not the way to go. <laughs> totally, totally. We, Damien asks, can you touch briefly on web platforms for, for websites uh, like WordPress, Webflow, et cetera? Yeah. what you use and prefer or if it is project-based? That's awesome question. So we do typically use WordPress. Um, we're exploring some diversification with a couple of different um, CMSs. We have a few examples of, of things that we've done in other areas, but WordPress has continued to be, um, given the proliferation of tooling and, um, and ways that it can be customized for an individual uh, client, it oftentimes is what we come back to. Um, Webflow has emerged and is, is pretty outstanding, but it's also really geared towards a static experience. As soon as you're wanting to layer in a lot more content, it gets much more difficult. Same thing on the opposite side of Shopify, which rarely comes up in the nonprofit um, social impact space, but sometimes it does. That is again, if you are all e-commerce and content is less of what you're, you're conscious of, that might be the right solution for you. But as soon as you start to be thinking about content, about gated experiences, about learning uh, and LMS, you're either going to have to shoehorn a bunch of tools together to try to create a cohesive experience, or you've got one platform that, that can scale with you. Um, so we do typically do WordPress builds, um, but then, like I said, there's other ones out there that definitely based on the requirements of the project, we would either advise diversifying or say, here's why we continue to think that this is the right solution for you for the, for the long term. We have two questions about how important SEO is. Can mm -hmm. you clarify? Very important. Um, and Google is constantly updating. Um, they actually just a few weeks ago released yet another update, um, what it is that they um, are recommending and what they're looking for from a search engine perspective. So the big thing um, about SEO compared to when um, I was first starting out in my career is that we have we, we think that we're smarter than the machines, but the machines are smarter than us. And so really staying true to your message and really honoring what it is that people are searching for and doing the research to understand what it is that they want is going to serve you the best. But trying to game the system with a bunch of keywords and trying to make it do your bidding, it will never work. And typically the end user will be the catalyst for why that won't work. Because if you're not creating a strong experience that you want to enjoy, you're just trying to stuff keywords in, in the hopes that Google ranks you, um, your users won't like that either. So visitors will go to the page, not enjoy it, and go away quickly. And Google's tracking all of that. And so as you are thinking about what your website um, needs to do from a search perspective, do the research externally to understand what people are searching for, and then spend the time understanding and accepting that it's going to be an iterative undertaking of continual improvement, not one shot. Awesome. Michael asks, are there steps that BrightWeb takes to help prevent the possibility of websites you've developed from not being ha from being hacked or attacked? Mm -hmm. Not sure if protective measures are put in place somewhere in the website, uh, hoster, host or server choice. Yep. Yeah, it, it definitely comes into what we recommend from a hosting perspective. Um, and we oftentimes will look at um, WordPress, again, being a lot of what we do. Um, WordFence is one tool that we, we recommend a lot. Um, there's different measures for blocking potentially malicious traffic, um, especially from regions of the world that you anticipate are not actually looking for, for your website. Um, and other ways to just make sure that you've got the two-factor authentication on, you've got very strong you know, policies in terms of passwords. There's other ways that um, if you've ever logged into a site through your um, Facebook account or through your Google account, it's called single sign-on. There's ways that you can do that too. That again is another measure that gets around the WordPress interface. So we do work um, to make sure that we're doing our best to create um, a secure environment. But part of that comes down to for WordPress specifically, keep your plugins up to date, keep WordPress up to date and make sure that people are, are not using password one, two, three as their password. Um, those are some of the measures to make sure that you know you're you're better set up for success. Nice. Um, 
one of the questions is, do you ever recommend use of Google AdWords and for what sort of scenarios? Yeah, I think AdWords is, um, it can be good from a visibility perspective. I think it, it depends a little bit on what you're using it for. Um, oftentimes, you know, we're all very smart now when it comes to what it is that we're looking at in, in, a, in a search experience. Um, and so we are less likely to click on those ads than ever before. But from an awareness building standpoint, they can be, they can be great. Um, but it's just knowing, going into any sort of ad buy with intention of, do I care if someone clicks or am I just looking for impressions? And if you're comfortable with it being brand building versus always just being about acquisition, then it can have a higher value. But if it really is every dollar has to be going towards acquisition, in most cases, I would probably find other ways to, to use those funds. Many very small or early stage orgs use tools like Weebly, Squarespace, et cetera. Mm -hmm. you, you had mentioned this at the very beginning of the presentation, but could you just uh, repeat some of the pros or cons or limits yeah. of some platforms? Yeah, they're they're quite limited. So I'm on the board of our, our local daycare um, and we use, we use Weebly and there's been no imperative for us to change from that. Um, but they are limited in terms of the ability to integrate um, donation mechanisms to really elaborate on the experience. Um, but for a small organization where you need to show content, you need to have a single call to action that might direct somewhere else and that's okay, um, to showcase photos, some videos, that's perfectly fine. It's usually because it's such a small um, environment that's familiar and, and has catered towards people who are not living this digital life every single day. It's usually more familiar, um, but as soon as you're trying to break the mold, that's where it will become um, almost impossible to be able to make it do exactly what you want. Um, and so being comfortable within constraints, you should be oftentimes perfectly fine, um, but it does come with some some compromised um, sort of flexibility and, and definitely some performance implications as well. Well, Rachel, thank you. So that has been the majority of the questions. The remainder are all about how people can learn more about BrightWeb, BrightWeb's yeah. platform, as well as perhaps stay in touch with, with you all. So yeah. what, what would be the best way to, to reach out after this webinar? Absolutely. So you can reach out to me at rachel.segal, S-E-G-A-L, at brightweb.com. Um, and yeah, happy to, to chat anytime and, and answer any other questions that came up from the call. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Rachel. That's all the time that we have today. It has been such a great webinar and people are, are sending you a lot of love in the chat. Thank so <laughs> we appreciate you sharing and uh, look forward to being in touch with everyone. The question, will you get a recording of this webinar? If you're a Be Social Change member, you will get a recording. Um, so be sure to sign up before you before the end of the day. Awesome. All right. Thank you so thank much, you everyone. So much, thank Rachel. you, Jen. Bye, Bye. everyone. <laughs>